Hello, good morning. My name is Naif Al Haddad. I'm the chair of the MENA chapter for the World Association of PPP Units and PPP Professionals. Today, we're going to hold the session for the deal development pipeline and case studies. So, as they say, it's kind of hard to man the stage after the Rolling Stones. And what we heard today, you know, from our fellow colleagues and expertise, we're going to do our best. And in this session today is going to be kind of different. So the whole setup here of holding Abu Dhabi BBB forum is for WAB and the PPP units and those who are relating to PPP. But today I'm going to hold a session for the stakeholders, the other stakeholders on the side of the table, not the PPP unit. We talk about like, you know, sovereign funds, public funds, as well as the private sector and contractors as, for example, Mr. Philip Desoy, the global head of business development from B6 Group. And I have also from the Supreme Funds, I have Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Badr Drisi, Chief Investment Officer from Ithmar Capital of Morocco. I have Mr. Khad Al Khatib, Investment Director of Rakiza Fund of Sultanate of Oman as well. And Mr. Ahmed Al Hamadi, Director of Financial Sustainability and Investment Department, Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure, United Arab Emirates. I would like to thank. United Arab Emirates and the state of Abu Dhabi for hosting us and holding us today with their hospitality. So this session today, we're going to talk about like the other stakeholders experience with PPPs, their dealings with the, BB, with the PPP unit and the practice. So, and I, I would like also to put in my personal, you know, experience and reflection about what we have faced from PPP, especially post COVID-19. It was brutal and it redefined the concept of PVBs and the directive of PVBs, especially like you know, endured COVID, it was a truly crucial need for medical and related infrastructure services for that for that purpose during the epidemic. And from onwards, especially like with the releases of commitments for the COB, the last two COBs that happened. And you know, concerning carbon reduction, carbon emission reduction and ESG requirements, and also the change of heart from the corporate, the global corporate, talk about like the multilateral development banks, as well as capital markets, just like, you know, what our colleagues yesterday, like just a minute ago, Mr. Abachi said, you know, about like having PBBs to be ESG rated, or related to, to be committed to. It's a challenge for the PBB units. Now we're gonna listen to what the private sector and the sovereign funds think about like the current situation. So in the beginning, I'm going to just open up the, the floor and ask my first question is, which we're going to have a reflection is right now. So our dear panels, now looking at holding right now, we're holding the Abu Dhabi BBB forum here in Abu Dhabi, the MENA region. I would like to hear your, your view on the current BBB practice in this region and the market the opportunities. What are the challenges? What are the incentives? So our BBB unit representatives, as well as me, I'm representing also a BBB unit, would learn from you and go back and reshape and think about like how to, you know, I would say we strategize what's our mission. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Maybe Mr. Mr. Khaled would like to start. Yeah, I can start. Just a correction. We, we are an, an infrastructure fund. We are commercially driven. We have investments from sovereign wealth funds and uh, uh, various large institutions, but we're not classified as a sovereign wealth fund ourselves, just to make that uh, correction before we start. Obviously, you know, the, the region has seen a lot of PPPs uh, over the past uh, years. Uh, we can speak about Oman's experience, for example, Oman started its PPP journey uh, back in the 90s in the electricity and water sector, both in the generation of water uh, and the desalination of water and generation of electricity. And also, uh, the, the government at the time worked on structuring the electricity sector, the utility sector, so the distribution, the uh, transmission and supply businesses associated with it. And really what had uh, uh, made this a success is the, uh, the, the, the framework, the regulatory framework that came with it. So. At the end of the day, the regulator was set up to be an independent regulator. 
uh, and we had uh, policies that were uh, that were basically uh, guided by the government's objective, and we had uh, participants that bought into this uh, regulatory framework. So at the end of the day, you as a as an investor want to know that you're going to be treated fairly when you want to invest in these projects. You want to know that uh, you know you're going to earn a fair return on your investment. And you as a consumer, you want to ensure that you're going to uh, pay a fair price for the service that uh, you're going to be um, receiving. And the government wants to ensure that these objectives, it is its objectives, the long-term objectives for this sector is met. So uh, when, when you have these three constituents addressed, you have a successful story. And when you have a track record, then you can continuously sell new projects in that market. So in Oman, for example, we had a, a track record of these projects happened since the 90s. And it started with electricity and water, and then we moved into renewables. But then now the government wants to move into other sectors. Uh, and they've developed a PPP law. They've developed uh, regulations around that. And now they started uh, uh, trying to build a new wave of PPPs um, uh, and, and, and create new opportunities in other sectors that uh, we didn't have uh, before. So now the government is looking at uh, launching its first PPP. It's in the evaluation stage that's in the schools uh, sector, so social infrastructure. And, and the government has another 10, uh, six new projects in, 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 the, in, in the evaluation uh, stage right now and 10 more to come. So, yeah, so basically it comes down to really this regulatory framework and these laws and this consistency across the board. Mr. Hamadi? The PPP practice in the region is, uh, is expanding uh, year over year, although the PPP market in the main uh, region it is still small in comparison with the PPP market uh, globally most of the main uh, government uh, most of the main uh, governments are testing their potential uh, infrastructure project against the PPP approach in comparison with the traditional um, uh, traditional one they started to uh, to knowledge the wider benefit of the PAP as procurement method in comparison with the existing traditional uh, procurement. So uh, this is what like you know the the value for money comes from testing which is EBC versus PPPs. Uh, I just want to just a small intervention on what, what uh, Khalid said like about like you know yes I know Oman have a great experience in, since the 90s developing IBBs and IWBBs and then establish the PPP law and regulation. You know, in Kuwait, for example, we, no, it was the reverse. We established the law and then we established it. So the track records it makes a setup because like you would learn and go back to reshape how your progress is. Um, Mr. Bader, what do you think about like the current mean of region practice PPPs? Yeah, uh, thank you. First, I would like to congratulate uh, WAP for, for, for this event and also thank them for the opportunity. And also uh, thank the UAE and ADNIC and uh, uh, UNCTAD for, for this uh, uh, really interesting and successful event. Um, coming back to your question, yeah, it's quite interesting to see how things evolved these past years, especially um, given the successful shocks, so COVID, but also uh, uh, what's happening around the world regarding uh, climate change and sustainability. Uh, for example, in Morocco, we have a strong track record when it comes to IPPs. But today, the urgency is, is access to water. So there is a large program um, to develop uh, desalination units. And so we are trying to capitalize on what we've done on, uh, uh, with IPPs to electri in electricity generation. So there is a new law, uh, amended um, law for PPPs in order to uh, promote and foster investments 
um, and given the, 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 the size of the needs, there is no way that the government could finance or fund these projects. We'll also talk about this maybe later regarding the execution capabilities, um, uh, both in numbers and in quality of PPP units and line ministries. And this is where uh, 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 investment funds, both private and, and public, but also private developers and companies could help uh, the government uh, in order to deploy uh, and implement more, uh, more projects. But we see these challenges as uh, opportunities in order to uh, uh, start this uh, both energy um, uh, uh, and technology transition when it comes to critical infrastructures, but also social infrastructures, so healthcare and, and education. For example, in Morocco, uh, we are developing a large uh, vaccine facility through a PPP uh, scheme, not from a legal perspective, but having both private and public mm -hmm. Uh, investors and developers uh, building and then operating this this facility so absolutely covid uh, and successful uh, and um, and the other shocks subsequent shocks uh, are changing how we see ppps and how government are are dealing with this because again uh, given the social needs there is no enough uh, fiscal resources or or budgets in order to sustain and and and, and build all these critical infrastructures thank you I think one of the, the main aspects and the challenges is that it has to be a routine practice by the state to go back and identify the needs on almost routine basis and form it to a price rise like you know the needs, especially when it comes like you know the medical and social right now. We have a whole dedicated almost session on like social infrastructure and this is the new trend that's happening even here like in the GC region. And we see like there is a major approach because in the beginning, I mean like and this is like, you know, take it from my experience, you know, the public doesn't know the benefits of an IPP or IW, they don't, they don't deal with it directly. When you talk about like medical service or social service, they, they interact with it and they will see the benefits of PPPs. Mr. Desoy, what do you think about like the market here as a contractor? Yes, I mean, um, as a contractor, I mean, first, what, what we want, of course, is to, to de-risk the, the project and why, why a contractor would go into PPP I think, I mean, in our case, in B6 uh, uh, case, it was more to have, a, let's say, a stable revenues over the long term. I mean, you know that contractors' revenues are going up and down according to the project, and some are successful, some are not successful. So, let's say, the PPP gives to the contractor, let's say, a stable base uh, of revenue and, and profit, of course. And when we went into PPP the, the first time, let's say, we were approached by the government of Ajman, I think most of you know Ajman here, but Ajman is a very small emirate, not rich as uh, Abu Dhabi or, or Dubai. And there was an infrastructure gap in Ajman. I mean, the city of Ajman was full of uh, septic tank and uh, I would say not very healthy uh, to live there. And so they approached us to, to put in place a PPP that was in, uh, in 1998, 1999. So early stage of the, the PPPs, except in the power and the, and the water sector, of course. And it was so a PPP for wastewater. So we had quite lengthy discussion with government of Ashman, with some financing uh, institution, with banks. And finally, let's say after uh, quite a lengthy discussion, we managed to have this PPP in place. And today, I would say the, the situation of Ashman has uh, improved a, a lot into uh, uh, sanitation and almost every area of the, the city is connected now to, to the wastewater system. After that, we moved, I mean, recently in the, in the Gulf uh, into PPP for waste to energy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, of course, for the moment, a, a successful project. I mean, we managed a financial close uh, quite, not quickly, but quite successfully. And after that, we have been approached by other uh, state or other government to put up, let's say, a waste to energy facility in their country. But that's not so easy. I mean, why? Because we need, of course, the, the collection of, uh, of the rubbish to be uh, delivered in the plant. I mean, we, we are not collecting the, the waste. And, I mean, to make it uh, successful also, we need a gate fee. So, let's say each PPP is, is different from uh, another PPP. The other PPPs in the, in the Emirates that we have are also related to wastewater. And that's in, with the government of Abu Dhabi, of course, that's very stable. 
And let's say uh, we are looking now uh, at some social PPP, the one you mentioned. So we have a school PPP going on into in Abu Dhabi uh, with a plenary. I think uh, they will talk later on about it. And we have also hospital PPP, which is under negotiation in, uh, in Dubai. Uh, when we speak about the MENA region, unfortunately, let's say the economies are quite different. I mean, we, we have some cash-rich uh, uh, government, uh, like uh, the one of uh, Abu Dhabi or Qatar, or Qatar or Kuwait even. But we have also some countries like uh, Egypt. And then in Egypt, I mean, another issue is the exchange risk. I mean, the, the exchange risk for, for contractors or for investors is, is quite important. And uh, Jorge mentioned in the previous uh, panel that CAF, uh, the, the Latin American uh, MDB, have some uh, ideas for covering the exchange risk. I mean, it would be quite interesting to have some discussion about it. I mean, this is applicable, I think, in some countries outside of the, the GCC uh, countries, of course. Maybe Morocco a little bit, but not so much. But I mean, if you take Egypt, it's a, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge risk. So, so the view of contractor is more, let's say, to, to de-risk this project. I mean, we are of course there to, to, to do the project, let's say, to, to construct it, to build it. But we are also there for the maintenance of the project. And usually, let's say, it's a, it's a long-term investment. I mean, if we take B6, for example, we never sell the share we have in the PPP so far, and we have some of them. For, for 20 years, no, uh, the one in, uh, in Ashman. Touching, touching, touching on that, when you say that, you know, these risks. Now, I'm going to ask you for your secret recipe, okay? Right now, as a contractor, and also as like, you know, as funds. What is your, your internal practice when you're assessing where to work at, as for BBBs, and assessing the situation? Should I go here or there? I mean... How would you evaluate it internally? What are like, you know, the, I would say the things that you're looking for to, to consider working? You have different systems, you have different countries. For you, Mr. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so what are we looking for? I mean, first, I mean, is to, to have a bankable project. I mean, uh, you, you know, PPP study is costing a lot of money. I mean, we are used to spend uh, a few millions of dirham or even a million of dollars uh, just like that for, for some uh, pre-development cost of uh, PPP. So these are very expensive, uh, let's say, uh, projects to, to develop. So we want to make sure the project is, of course, bankable. We, we look also at the environment uh, to make sure the project is well prepared. I mean, some clients come to you and they say, oh, I want a PPP, but yeah, on, on which basis? Uh, I mean, uh, do you have a feasibility study which was done by some reputable institution? Uh, do you have funds which are moving with you uh, to, to join force? I mean, we, we cannot do this alone, uh, usually. I mean, PPPs are, are quite uh, capital uh, intensive uh, for contractors, for sure. So, let's say we look at different uh, uh, topics. Uh, the, the one I mentioned also, exchange rate, uh, stability of the country also is very important for us. I mean, we, we will talk maybe later on about some countries which are less stable than the, the, the GCC countries. Uh, if you take PPPs in uh, Latin America, I mean, we, we have an experience of some political instability, same in Africa. So all this, let's say, take, take a, a lot of importance before we decide to go into, into a PPP uh, in, in, in a special project uh, in, or in a country. Even. Yeah. And like you said, also, like, you know, I would say global effects, just like fluctuation for foreign currency, just like, you know, the ones having, for example, Egypt or like, you know, some places war, like, you know, inflation would also be crucial. Yes, things. I mean, for example, Egypt, I think it's impossible today to, to hedge the Egyptian pound. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's more a uh, political decision than an uh, economic decision. So, uh, let's say the banks are, are not uh, willing to hedge the, the, the currency. And hedging is costing a lot of money, so it's adding a lot of money, of course, to, to the cost of the PPP as well. Now, I'm going to ask a question. You, you know, Mr. Hamad, you, you're presenting the state, the, the state of government of Abu Dhabi, you know, and Mr. Mr. Khaled, you know, coming from the GCC, and you have to go talk a lot, like, you know, taking us, like, from the sides of the table, talk about, like, the PPP units. Especially here, like in the GC region, for being natives of the GC region, there have been changes over time, laws, reshaping laws, going back in the drawing table, and 
sometimes in like some units would be just expanding and the mandate maybe slimming down maybe bundling similar situation even almost having uh, also at Kuwait and you know, we keep hearing about like you know sometimes bundling reassignment of duties whatsoever how would it affect the interest do you think as like you know and how to mitigate it is like from the investor side as well what 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 what, what is what you think is like the pros or cons or like the effects of such a good decision so Hamadi uh, recently when the uh, when there is any kind of restructuring in, in the government restructuring uh, they are giving a big support for the uh, investment and alternative financing function uh, let's say one of the major example in the mystery of uh, energy and infrastructure they established one department is called uh, financial sustainability and investment which was responsible for the all ppp uh, project or any kind of uh, investment uh, or the, altern uh, the alternative uh, financing uh, function uh, project. The result was uh, in this, uh, there are so many projects in the pipeline, uh, let's say in the all mystery sector, uh, housing and energy and infrastructure and uh, the marine and land transport. On the other hand, also, uh, in the local government, they established uh, so many uh, departments in, let's say, uh, for example, Dubai Municipality or Dubai Land Authorities uh, or Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid uh, uh, Housing Establishment. They established, let's say, kind of uh, department which was specialized in, in the PVP. Um, to be sure or to encourage uh, the more private sector uh, participation and private uh, investment. This is in my, uh, in my vision. It's more like decentralization than having a single unit. Yeah. Well, Khaled? Uh, so uh, can, you, can you just remind me of the topic again? So like, okay. Now, you know, especially like here recently in the, in the uh, you mean we, the we talk about like change, topic. change yeah. of laws, uh, the units, the sh reshaping of the units, switching, the reassignment. Yeah. So definitely any, any change has consequences. And I think governments and procurement agencies need to appreciate and understand that these consequences will lead to effects. And sometimes these effects are negative. <clears throat> in the case of PPPs, if there are a lot of disruptions in the system, investors are going to be afraid uh, investors would walk away lenders would not be comfortable in funding these projects as well as developers and contractors so what an investor wants is a stable system and we go back to the regulatory framework if there is a regulatory framework that is clear if there is a, uh, a law and a system that is established then there is confidence that this project is going to go through as an investor as a contractor you don't want to find yourself working on a project for a year or two and then realizing that this project is not going anywhere. Yeah, uh, yeah. You've spent a million dollars, you've spent two million dollars on, on developing this project and eventually this project doesn't go through. So definitely these changes uh, have their impacts and I think uh, the governments need to be alive to these uh, issues. Mr. Desoy, you've been working for like maybe 20 years right now in the region? Why would you identify the red flags on a BBB project? I'm going to open with you and let everybody turn it. I mean, the, the red flags, I think, for me, would be first, the project has to be bankable. Okay. I mean, the contractors need some, I mean, or the investor uh, needs some guarantee. I mean, I was talking about Ashman, for example, for the wastewater. I mean, one of the red flags was to be paid, of course of the cost of treating this water. And we finalized, we finalized at the end, uh, but it took a long time, we finalized an agreement with uh, FIWA, which is the Federal Electricity yeah. uh, Government Authority, to have, let's say, an, an agreement that if the, the landowner or, or the, the, the people don't pay the fee for wastewater, because it's quite difficult to measure it, so let's say the FIWA would uh, come and uh, cut, cut, of course, the, the electricity. So you need some power to make sure that the investors 
all the contra and the contractors are, are paid later on for, for what uh, they do, for the service they give. Um, another red flag, of course, uh, I mean, I mentioned it before, is the, the currency exchange. I mean, we, we as contractors are not, are not ready to take the risk for currency exchange, of course. Uh, another red flag again, I mean, is to have, let's say, some PPP which are well prepared. Because I mentioned uh, to spend uh, a few million dollars and then to see that we go nowhere. I mean, it, it's not, it's not something let, let me, we... Let me clarify yeah. something. What is it like to be bail? Yeah. We talk about like the availability of funds or the availability to proceed the payments. Yeah, I mean, to, yeah, yeah. To, not to be paid, of course, we will be paid. But yeah. I mean, the, the SPV needs some revenues uh, from from somebody, let's mm -hmm. say so, or it is the the people who, who use the the facility, mm -hmm. uh, like wastewater. But wastewater, you jump, you just dump your water into the system. Uh, there is see, no see control. One of, see, so. one of the challenges yeah. we keep facing is, you know, the physical budgeting allocation for like state government entities yeah. with PPP commitments, like uh, like uh, I would say the payment scheduling. Yeah. So there's always a challenge in alignment for both. Yes, 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 there is. I mean, but okay, that's calculation of cash flow and to see uh, how to, to mitigate the, the negative uh, drop into payments and all these things. I mean, uh, you mentioned COVID, for example. Yeah. Uh, COVID was, of course, uh, a major issue for uh, PPP. So some PPP owners, uh, the one into airport, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it was a very difficult time uh, to have uh, one year without... Uh, any activities in the airport. So depend, I think it depends a lot on the, the activity of the, the PPP. If you go by your contractual PPPs, for example, I mean, if, if the government has gone into a contractual PPP, they know that this is the amount of money that I need to pay this month or that month or this year. And this should be really budgeted as a contingent liabilities until the end of that uh, procurement, rather than leaving it to the year's budget to see what I can allocate to and what not allocate to. So if it is part of the government's fiscal policy, it could be managed. But Khaled, no, no state is going to allocate, for example, the budget for 25 years in a lump sum. Not in a lump sum, but obviously you plan, right? You know, it's a contingent, it has it's to be a contingent liability. Year to year. This is what like, the difference happens with like, you know, the private sector and the public sector. Like, as yeah, kind of that's why I said you. contingent. It's not a, obviously, you, you're not going to budget for it today, but it, it is a contingent liability on your, uh, yeah. on your balance sheet, and you need to manage this contingent liability. You've, you, you as a procurer have come into this and you've committed towards it. So you, you need to be able to honor that commitment. Better, what do you think? <laughs> no, it's... Uh, sorry. I mean, because our mandate is quite hybrid, hybrid um, being a sovereign fund, because we are both, uh, you know, public with a private DNA. So we are hearing uh, I mean, from both sides, we totally agree and understand what Khalid and Philip are, are, are saying, and it's true. I mean, you need sound governance, you need uh, sound legal framework, you need visibility and clarity on the offtake agreement in order, because we're talking about projects for 20, 30 years. But also, uh, on the other hand, uh, you have you know, the government with these needs trying to address them. Um, with limited both, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, resources and capabilities from a, a human capital perspective, but also technical uh, aspects, um, uh, especially today. I mean, projects are more and more sophisticated uh, given the evolution of technologies. When we talk about renewable energies, when we talk about waste to energy, uh, when we talk about also water, um, soon about green hydrogen, um, in the in the PPP space, uh, so we need to bridge this uh, gap, and I think there is this uh, uh, missing link between uh, governments, PPP units, um, line ministries, and the private sector, both investors, financial investors um, like the uh, Khalid's Fund, or also developers and contractors like uh, BISICS, uh, because. Sometimes they don't speak the same language yeah. because of the constraints and objectives. Uh, but I think, I mean, someone mentioned it, uh, having a clear and sound business uh, and legal framework is a prerequisite in order to consider a, a, a PPP project, again, given the long-term horizon of this kind of, uh, of project. For us as sovereign funds, uh, what is also important is uh, what we call the double bottom line approach because we have a dual mandate. We, of course, 
uh, seek commercial viability. So we are for-profit organization, but also uh, seeking developmental uh, impact. So we will not consider projects that are viable uh, on a you know private terms because private sector will do it. We'll we'll try to uh, find projects that need this, let's say, public money, public incentive, uh, in order to be viable or de-risk them, uh, and also come in at a very early stage, in order to de-risk and maybe share the burden of the pre-feasibility studies, given the uh, their capital intensive uh, nature. Um, so this is the missing uh, uh, link or middle between these two sides that are seeking the same objective. So we try to um, work with two hats in order to both help assist uh, PP units, PPP units, line ministries, but also uh, try to convince uh, private investors and developers uh, by, by um, uh, putting both um, you know, sweat equity, but also uh, money uh, in order to fund uh, some profitability study, and why not also uh, uh, at financial close? Because when you talk about sovereign funds, especially the strategic ones, not the uh, cash long ones, like here in the region or in Asia, like in China, Singapore, um, we, we call them actually capital allocators because they have this huge pool of money and they are deciding where to put it. Um, while sovereign or strategic funds in emerging markets and even in Europe uh, today are more like capital seekers because they, they have limited resources and they are trying to have this multiplier effect. Um, so every time we are considering a project, we need to have this uh, uh, 2x, 3x on a dollar in order to uh, uh, develop it and, and, and uh, implement it. So when 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 we develop a project, the objective is not the investment. The investment is a consequence of our work as sovereign funds, uh, because we need to uh, uh, um, uh, carry out all the profitability studies alongside private companies because they have the expertise. We don't have, at best, we are good investment professionals. They have the technology, they have the track record. So we work uh, um, side by side with these uh, private companies. So in, in a sense, every project that the sovereign funds is, a strategic fund is, Developing is a PPP because we will never invest uh, alone. Again, we don't have the technology or the expertise. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the challenge is to find this right balance between the public needs, uh, public realities when it comes to decision making, when it comes to uh, legal framework, but also trying to convince. And all this actually, there is one simple uh, uh, step or item um, to, to address all this is the risk allocation matrix. Within this risk allocation, you will say, okay, this risk is best handled by the private uh, side. This risk will be handled by the investor and this risk will be handled by MDBs. Or at the end, you have maybe some remaining risks. So, and, and this is what makes projects go through or not. If you manage this remaining risk, for example, sometimes you have uh, uh, projects that are you know, bankable, but not enough for private uh, investors to be considered. Yeah. So here you have the role of sovereign funds, yeah. for example, came in as uh, you know, to enhance the risk profile and also the return of the project based on you know, some uh, uh, first loss mechanism, asymmetric returns mechanism. I know that private investors cannot consider it, but sovereign funds as public entities do this in some kind, in some projects in order to make them uh, bankable and de-risk part of them. So this is what leads me to my next question. It led me all sure. the way to sovereign funds. Now the sovereign funds already been established, been traditional in the way they operate. There's a major shift right now. We see uh, the major sovereign funds of Saudi Arabia buying shares in Nintendo. The video games, they're going into also video games, they're going into projects, they're going into sports. Diversification of the portfolio they have. And some of the mandates of sovereign funds is just like as per like you know the state's mandate to, in, to spend both in some equity, to contribute to the equity of the PPP project. Now, how do you see the impact of sovereign funds? Or you better? Yeah. Okay. And how it could align the mandate right now? Because I see that there is a shift, the major shift right now. Yeah. Let's see from that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, Clearly, I mean, these, let's say, last decade uh, mandates of sovereign funds are shifting and evolving, and each year we have new uh, 
uh, sovereign funds being established by several countries, even again in Western countries in Europe, for example, uh, the UK has established also what is similar to a sovereign fund. Greece also have a new sovereign funds. But when, it, when, when you look at their mandate, it's always the same, trying to diversify the economy, trying to attract, mobilize capital and investors. So when, for example, I mean, um, funds or sovereign funds are investing in, in Asian or, or, or US companies, at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is to bring this technology or know-how um, uh, uh, to their countries in order again to have this developmental impact, uh, creating, jo creating jobs, generating foreign exchange currencies, generating uh, opportunities for uh, SMEs uh, uh, in their domestic markets. Um, the, the, the mandate is actually very aligned when you look at it because um, as we see it as sovereign funds, um, and it's, maybe it's not, um, uh, our stakeholders don't share the same vision. Our mandate is not towards, uh, towards our stakeholders, it's towards our future generations, our children and children of our children. So we, we, we are patient investors, yeah. um, as opposed to a, a pure infrastructure or PE fund uh, that has you know, an investment horizon, uh, return objectives in order to, you know, return the, the capital with a profit, uh, with a, an IRR uh, to the LPs uh, of, of the fund. So we can be more uh, long term, so we can consider risks that maybe a pure private infrastructure fund could not consider. Uh, so this is aligned with the uh, agenda and the long term uh, strategies of a government. When, when we talk about you know, infrastructure strategies, social infrastructures. Um, so the, 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 uh, in, in, in this sense, we, we need to work together um, and, and act as a relief for the PPP units and line ministries, because again, uh, uh, they have a lot to do. We have uh, the capabilities, uh, the means, but also uh, the frequent and constant dialogue with private investors so let me clarify, there's yeah, no sure. mechanism right now. Uh, there's no mechanism, no set mechanism right now for like engagement with the PPP unit? It's, I mean, it depends. Uh, it's on a country by country basis. If so you, for example, let's, let's talk about Egypt, uh, example, when it comes to desalination units. Uh, all the uh, stake, public stakeholders involved in the water uh, uh, and desalination uh, process delegated their authority to the sovereign fund of Egypt in order to uh, identify, prepare, procure, implement more than 15 uh, uh, diesel units. So they've done all the uh, feasibility studies, the request for uh, uh, interest. They shortlisted the players, I mean the private operator, operators, and they are working on their, I mean the tendering of the process. So if you take just this example, it's working. So the sovereign fund of Egypt is deploying more than 15 uh, diesel unit in Egypt because the framework was quite clear and they, they empowered the sovereign fund to do so. Uh, so they have the uh, uh, expertise, um, both legal and financial structuring expertise. They have the right uh, you know, dialogue connections with the private developers. So it's quite successful experience, actually. We, we'll see, I mean, later when they will implement these projects, but it's working. We can also, uh, there's also another a very interesting example in Gabon, in Africa, where the, the Strategic Investment Fund of Gabon has been uh, interested to develop a toll road in, in Gabon. And they, they developed what they've called a pre-concession agreement. Mm -hmm. So the government uh, uh, gave uh, uh, the license to the Gabonese fund in order to uh, perform the pre-feasibility studies and depending on the outcome of these pre-feasibility studies, they will go through and then launch the, the tendering in order to select uh, a private developer. So we see that, especially in emerging markets, more and more uh, governments and line ministries are relying on sovereign funds in order to help them, assist them, uh, depending on, on, the, on the project and nature of the projects, to develop more PPP projects. Again, based on uh, uh, the internal, let's say, uh, uh, capabilities of sovereign funds and their uh, constant dialogue with private uh, investors.
Let me let me add you something which sure, is sure. maybe quite a different. Just to touch on base, you know. Uh, from where I come from, Kuwait, the sovereign fund and the pension funds are required to participate in PPP projects. We talk about the projects that exceed like 118 million dollars in capex. They're like required, and they have to have a share like in the in the stock joint SBV company, like 20 percent max or 25 percent max. So they have to be con. But right now there is maybe a, a choice because then it was just uh, it, it was just like enforced. Right now, like you know, the, the there is I would say a recognition of how the sovereign funds are acting for, it. and uh, like locally they're establishing right now an infrastructure fund. So Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has been doing so, yeah. as well as like you know other countries. In Kuwait, there's like it, we're just focusing on mainly infrastructure funds to support. And I see a lot of private sector think about like you know when they see bubble funds entering, they say like well yes, there's a good sign. This project is bankable, there's state guarantees, there's interest, you know, there's pension fund is coming in. So this project should proceed forward as planned, you know. Uh, Khaled, do you have anything you want to maybe add? No, I mean, you all mentioned the positive uh, <laughs> notes maybe. On, on the other hand, you know, you know, just looking at it from the other perspective, uh, for, for a contractor or for a bidder, when they know that one consortium, for example, has a sovereign player in there, it kind of skews the. It it kind of skews the uh, 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 the perspective of of the other bidders. So, at the end of the day, a government uh, should have the ability to support whatever projects it wants to support, whether it is in the form of guarantees, and it could choose the entity it uh, utilizes to do that, if the project requires uh, that support. But, you know, at the end of the day, these are public-private partnerships. You, you, you want the private sector participation into, at, the, at the end of the day. Uh, and if you don't need the sovereign support, you shouldn't interfere in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do, then you should be mindful of the consequences or the, you know, view of what it could look like and what impacts it could have on the bidding process. Well, see, because of, you know, I mean, I've dealt with sovereign funds and, and like when they're injecting and becoming partners as a stakeholder, like in the beginning, like remember the word I said, like I use a stakeholder, like they're the stakeholder. Uh, the majority control always remain with a strategic investor. We talk about like the private sector, because in the end, he's the one you are recurring his services, his knowledge, his expertise to come in. You're not coming and bringing it in and then letting the public entity running the project. Otherwise, it's, it's a public project. You didn't get the idea. The idea is to get the you know, the expertise, the knowledge, the manpower, uh, the, uh, the experience that's coming from the private sector. Uh, I'm, I don't know if we're going to have a Q&A, like I don't know if we have resolved the microphone, but I'm going to go for like uh, just one, two more rounds. I'm going to ask a question, which is just something which has been, I believe a lot of people have been trying to figure out like here in this region. I'm going to ask you, Mr. Desoy, as like, coming privately from the private sector, dealt with these projects. And I know a lot of people here coming representing PPP and it's unsolicited proposals. We have a challenge, we have an issue. I want to I wanna hit on this table. What do you think of unsolicited proposals and the potential for like, since this region has been practicing and you heard from like, and you've been in this region for 20 years. You know, Oman has been practicing, in a, Kuwait we've been doing BOT framework since like 1980s. We haven't seen an unsolicited proposal project to be established. The better is, you know, smiling and knows the, the concept. What do you see? There's any potential at all to conduct a PV project via an answer proposal? I mean, I, th I think yes, of course. Uh, I mean, I told you we have been more than 20 years into PPP in Ajman. I mean, Ajman is really a small emirate where, I mean, nobody would have expected to, to have a PPP there uh, 20 years ago. And I mean, when you talk about implication of uh, government or government agencies, I mean, Abu Dhabi, of course, is more, let's say, um, involved into the PPP, for example, the one we have in Abu Dhabi, uh, we are only 20%, and Abu Dhabi government has 60% uh, share into the SPV. But when you take Ajman, Ajman government is only 30%. So it depends on, on the, the willingness of the, of course, the, the government or the sovereign fund, if there is one, but it gives some comfort also to the private uh, investor, to the contractor. Yeah. Something else maybe also worth to mention is that when you have a private partner with you, 
let's say the private partner, I mean, one is of course knowledgeable into, into the topic, can bring some uh, diversification itself into the project. I mean, in Ashman, for example, instead of just treating the wastewater and use it for irrigation, I mean, that's what Abu Dhabi still do today, but then we, we managed to convince Ashman government to polish this water and to reuse it for the industry. And I mean, that was generating some additional revenue. So let's say to have the private sector involved usually gives, I would say, better result than uh, only administration, with, which have a, a very defined mandate and are not looking out of the box how to improve, let's say, the, the revenue, how to make it better or to maintain also sometime, eh? because let's say when you are investor, I mean, you have to maintain the facility uh, for the 20 or 25 years, uh, you are the owner. So I think there is a benefit for, for the government to have private partner for sure. Yeah. I still receive also the proposal to today, till today, <laughs> believe me. It's wonderful, I mean, proposals. But the problem is sometimes, and maybe it's, it's, I would like to maybe bursely answer one of the questions, like what are the red flags in a PPP project? Unskilled counterparty, unskilled public counterparty. Yeah. Even with unskilled proposal, it just wouldn't work. And even like unskilled proposal, or even like as a tender, it wouldn't work. That's what like one mm -hmm. of the red flags. Uh, I want to close this round with just like one last uh, round to my uh, esteemed panelist. Now, after all would have been said and done, I'm going to start with Mr. Hamadi and also going to leave uh, the floor for you guys. Today, we talk about like today, October 2023. Mr. Hamadi, what do you see the sectors in this region, in the MENA region, which is up for growth? Talking like away from the power and energy. Uh, the power energy is already just a niche that has been established. What do you see of the, like the sector that's up for growth to be utilized and upgraded via PPPs? Uh, the potential uh, growth uh, now is for uh, social uh, infrastructure, uh, schools and uh, school and hospital. As you mentioned, uh, the energy sector as well. Uh, the pandemic uh, that occurred before three years shed the light on the importance of having a well-developed uh, healthcare system and without the effective private sector, without uh, private sector participation, this develop won't be achieved. We understand that private sector can bring a new technology, uh, a new business, and operating models that can help government minimize the operational risk over the term of the project. So, so as what I see, the, um, the social sector, hospital and schools, the major sector, which is uh, and especially for the future nowadays. I see UAE is also proceeding with yes, that. Yes, you are right. Yeah. I mean, maybe another topic maybe we did not mention so far. Um, I mean, some client in the GCC are, are complaining, or some administration are complaining that there is not enough bidders for PPP, usually, compared to traditional contracts. So maybe one advice would be also to, to compensate, let's say, the the loser of the, the PPP project uh, by some uh, some development fee which they have spent. I mean, that would attract maybe also more people. That's a very controversial aspect. Yes, I know, <laughs> but I mean, if you want to attract uh, contractors, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the resource of contractors are not unlimited. <laughs> we gotta have like a, a, a table, a face-off between contractors yeah. as well as PPP units to, to hammer this issue. <laughs> There's always a disclaimer, like in the documents, the RV documents, there's always a disclaimer, you know? Not responsible. Nothing can be yeah, compensated no. for. <laughs> yeah. Alan? I think, uh, I, mean, I mean, obviously we have uh, a great history in the electricity and water sector around the region. Uh, but, you know, the usual suspects, really, uh, social infrastructure, waste. Um, uh, you, you hear, for example, in the UE, they've embarked on a large waste uh, energy project in Oman, they've been flirting with the idea for quite some time and they, they're advancing with that project, but it's at an early stage right now. 
um, uh, and we can look even beyond your contracted uh, businesses where you look at broadband, which is in a sense a service today. Mm -hmm. It's not launched as a PPP, but you have independent players in the market that are uh, currently uh, operating around the region that, uh, uh, that, that provide the service. This is a regulated service. At the end of the day, you need to face a regulator. You need to provide a fair price and fair service to your customers, as well as tower businesses. Uh, in, in, in the previous panel, uh, data centers was mentioned. I think just this data uh, segment is, is a segment to look out for, especially in this region, as we move from 4G to 5G and, and, and you know, embarking on AI. No, definitely um, uh, digital infrastructure is a really strong investment team uh, in the region, but also in Africa. Uh, if we want to talk about, you know, uh, digital sovereignty of the continent, also food security, we think that it's a space that we could explore um, in a you know, PPP scheme where the public side will, you know, identify, prepare uh, the project, the lands, etc. And the uh, bidders will be, uh, you know, investing or, or bidding on this kind of uh, projects to you know, uh, produce uh, food. Uh, both actually for the country and also maybe for, for the region. We know that a lot of uh, sovereign funds from, from the GCC are investing in agricultural projects across the country and also in Latin America, in, uh, in Asia also. Um, healthcare also is a strong thing, especially after COVID. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to share is that uh, amongst the um, uh, sovereign funds community, of course, we are strong advocates of uh, PPPs, but on, not only this kind of PPPs. Uh, of course, PPP stands for public-private partnerships, but we also advocate for uh, uh, um, profit, people, and planet. So it's another PPP. Yeah. So for us, it's PPP square, because when we invest, we have this dual mandate. We need to have de developmental impact. So it's not only private-public partnership, but also for um, profit, because we are profit-oriented, but also people and uh, the planet, given the sustainability uh, goals and agendas also. Well, I think we've run out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, give our esteemed panelists a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>